In 2009, the American Iridium communication satellite collided with the Russian Cosmos communication satellite at 42,000 kilometers per hour. That collision generated over 2,000 pieces of softball-sized debris and thousands of smaller pieces. This was just one of the incidents that contributes to one of the most pressing problems in the space industry, space debris. Today, about 900,000 pieces of space debris between 1 and 10 centimeters in diameter litter low Earth orbit, which is where most of our satellites are. Most of these pieces are basically untrackable due to their small size, but they can still pack a punch because they're traveling at tens of thousands of kilometers per hour. Take for example, the damage caused to this space shuttle's window, which was created by a piece of debris that was only a few millimeters in size. What's worse is that what goes in orbit stays in orbit. Unlike Earth, space doesn't have oceans, wind, sand, or rain to slowly break down waste. So most of the debris up there is from old missions releasing dead weight, parts of space applications chipping off, or pieces of space debris crashing into each other and generating more debris. Space debris won't fix itself, which is why scientists have been coming together for years, testing different methods of removal. One of these methods is called laser ablation, which is aimed at pieces of debris 10 centimeters in diameter and smaller. So how does laser ablation work? It starts with a chaser satellite, which contains a laser. That laser is rapidly pulsed out of debris. You might actually find that when the laser and debris collide, a little bit of plasma is produced due to the concentration and rapidity of the pulses. Plasma is just a state of matter made of a gas of ions and free electrons. Don't worry, the plasma solidifies though, since it'll basically create a negligible amount of debris. Once the debris is hit by the laser many times, it'll start to slow down, and eventually, it can fall back into the Earth's atmosphere where it'll burn up. To demonstrate this, I've created a system that models a laser debris collision. The model basically takes in different parameter inputs for the laser and debris, and outputs how much their momentum and velocity change after the collision. To make it, I use Simulink, which is a MATLAB-based graphical programming software used to model dynamic systems. I know it might look confusing at first, but that's okay, because we'll break it down. Any box that's colored purple means it's a parameter input that can be changed. This includes things like the laser energy, the laser wavelength, the debris velocity, the debris mass, the plasma ejection velocity, and the collision angle between the laser and the debris. From that, the system outputs the laser momentum and the debris momentum after the collision in both the x and y direction, as well as the debris velocity in the diagonal direction. The first part of the model finds the momentum of a single laser pulse, which is broken down into finding a number of photons per pulse and the photon momentum. We start by finding the photon energy, which is found by multiplying Planck's constant by the speed of light and dividing that by the laser wavelength. Then to find the photon momentum, you just take Planck's constant and divide that by the laser wavelength. To find the number of photons per pulse, we have to multiply the photon energy by the laser energy. Then we can multiply the number of photons per pulse and the photon momentum to find the total pulse momentum. Now we have to find the total initial momentum of our system. To find the momentum of our debris, we just multiply its mass by its velocity. Then we add the laser momentum and the debris momentum together to find the initial momentum. The rest of the calculations are used to find numbers after the collision occurs. We can start with the change in the laser's velocity, which is found by multiplying the plasma ejection velocity by cosine 40 and sine 40. Translating these velocities into momentum is a little tricky too, but it can be done. We know that momentum is always conserved, so by dividing the laser pulse momentum by the laser collision velocity in each direction, we find the constant that's needed to multiply by the velocity to get the laser momentum. The next part of the system is finding the debris momentum after the collision, which is pretty simple. All you have to do is compare it to the initial momentum. For people less familiar with this, basically the initial momentum and the final momentum need to add up to zero. Then, to find the debris velocity, we just divide the debris momentum by the debris mass to get the velocity in each direction. Finally, we can use Pythagorean's theorem to find the debris velocity in the diagonal direction after getting hit by a laser pulse. The remaining signals from the system are connected to scope blocks, which you can then observe to see the values of those signals. So let's try an example. We'll set these parameters for the system. 
which are based off realistic conditions found by NASA researchers in 2011. After putting in the parameters and running the system, we need to open the scope blocks to find the values of the outputs. To read the signals after clicking the scope blocks, you need to go to Tools, then Measurements, and then click on Signal Statistics. Then from there, make sure that you turn on your legend. Once we click Run, we can go to the sidebar and see the value of each of the signals in the table. And then you can click through the toggle to look at them. Make sure you do this with both of the scope blocks. So after putting in the parameters for this model, we get these numbers. Now, most of them are basically negligible since they're so small, except for the post debris velocity in the diagonal direction, which is about 10,000 meters per second. Of course, this is a really simplified version of what the real situation would be like. The system doesn't include a lot of factors like the debris attitude, spin, or shape. So this system should only be used to develop a conceptual understanding of a laser debris collision. Now, people that are vaguely familiar with languages like Python or MATLAB might ask why I didn't create this system in those languages. After all, it might have been a lot simpler too. Well, there were a number of reasons that I chose Simulink, including its visual interface and MATLAB-based background. However, the main reason I chose Simulink was that so I could just seed this project and build more on it in the future. Simulink can actually do a lot more than what I've created, and someone with more experience could probably make a model that includes far more parameters and even link it to a virtual reality simulation where they can watch their model move. I still have a lot to learn, so by seeding this project now, I can come back in a few months' time when I know more about concepts like electromagnetism and orbital mechanics. But until then, I hope to keep expanding my knowledge in physics and mathematics so I can further my journey in space tech.